Oh, hey, church family, how you doing? Good, good. Me too. Thanks for being here. Let me just, I'll get it out of the way. I got to ask a question. Do I look any different today? What, what, what? I look older, you guys. <laughs> uh, you saw that coming. Yeah, yesterday was my birthday. I turned 55. That's old. I don't feel different. I don't feel older. I still feel like 18, 17, 19. Some of you are like, you act 18, 17, 19. But uh, anyway, thanks for being here. Glad that you're here. I'm glad that I'm here at 55 and uh, glad that you are watching online. My name is Troy. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, boy, we, we are blessed to be in Steamboat in September. This is my favorite month of the year. Amen. It's gorgeous, man. Autumn, it's going to be a wonderful, it's going to be a glorious autumn with all the uh, moisture that we've been getting. So I uh, hope you can hang out with us. But uh, thank you for being here on Labor Day, Labor Day weekend. I'm going to jump into this. I'm excited. Last week, we started our new series um, called uh, Perfect Family, The Perfect Family. And uh, uh, we do series, and this is a great series because I think uh, it applies to everyone um, every one of us is part of a family or has a family or will have a family uh, someday. And so I think you can get something out of this regardless of where you are. Um, last week, if you weren't here, I just want to kind of catch you up. Um, one of the things that we did is we talked about attention that we all feel when it comes to families, all right? Uh, there's a tension between basically the ideal and the real, Right? There's this tension between uh, uh, what things should be like and what we wish they were like and what we hope them would be like and what they're really like. Right? And uh, for example, maybe today, perhaps you might be going through a divorce. That's real, right? That's real. Or perhaps maybe you're on your second marriage and things aren't going so well on this one. And that's real. That's tough. And that's the reality. Uh, real might be for you that you're a newlywed. And you're discovering that marriage isn't as easy as you thought it would be. <laughs> Join the club. Welcome. <laughs> uh, or maybe real for you is that you have some kids and uh, they're not maybe doing the right thing. They're doing some stuff that's kind of scary to you and you're concerned. Or perhaps maybe you have a prodigal and they've left and you're praying that they come back home. There's some division between you and them. And, or, or maybe real for you is that you just, you know, your husband won't go to church with you. You'd love to do that. You'd love to kind of have your faith with him, but that isn't possible for whatever reason. So, like I said, there's this tension that we all kind of have to live with. And that is between the ideal, um, this ideal of having a perfect family, a wonderful family, a happy family, and the real what's really happening in our homes and our family. There's that tension. Now, the problem that I talked a little bit about last week is, is that our culture um, just basically encourages us to drop the ideal, to ditch that, to move on, you know, just get over it. They, our culture wants to get rid of that tension, those icky feelings, you know. It's like the culture just says, hey, it's okay, don't worry, everyone else is doing it, everybody's doing the same thing, everybody's doing it that way. Totally normal. Don't freak out. Don't stress. And so rather than live with the tension, our culture wants us to lower the bar, to lower down what we would want for our families. And, um, and, uh, and here's the thing. Uh, the thing inside of me is, is that um, I want more. I want more for my family. I want more for my marriage. You can tell me that that's just the way it is. And you can tell me that, you know, it's totally normal to to maybe go through a breakup or divorce, and I hear that, and I do see that. But when I think about my kids, and you're the same way, when you pray about your kids and you pray for your kids, um, if you're like me, you want your kids to have a better life than you had. You want the best for them. You want them to have the ideal. You want them to fall in love and to stay in love for a lifetime. Till death do they part. That's what we all want. That's what we're all praying for. And so... Lowering the bar, aiming lower, doesn't really make a lot of sense for us. And here's the interesting thing. I talked about this last week, and if you're feeling a little uncomfortable because of this, uh, hear me out. Uh, the interesting thing is that when Jesus came along, uh, Jesus pointed people to the ideal. He was always pointing people to, to, to aim high. He was pointed people to the ideal. He always pointed people to the ideal, but he never condemned people when they fell short of that. He never condemned them for it. Um, he, he, he made it painfully clear. He would say, Jesus would say, yes, there is a standard, and I want you to aim for that standard. And here's the problem. That standard is actually 
higher than you think it is, right? He said it this way. He said, you have heard, you know, that this is the standard. But I say to you, Jesus came along and made it worse. He goes, I say to you that it's actually this. And everybody's like, whoa, man, that's hard. Who can do that? None of us can, can attain that. And Jesus would say, maybe. But here's the thing. I want you to try. I want you to shoot high for that. I want you to try. I want you to live with this tension of, of, of aiming for the ideal even though you live in a less than ideal world. I want you to shoot for that. And if you fall short, here's the thing, and we may, and we do. Jesus would say, if you fall short, listen, you just need to know that wherever you are or whatever you've done, God's grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient. I got your back. I love you. We can do this. And so as we talk about families over these next few weeks and today, some of you are going to have the thought, oh, man, it's too late for me, Pastor Troy. I mean, my family is jacked up. It's messed up. It's all fouled up. My family will never be that way. My marriage will never be that way. Listen, uh, therein lies the tension. Jesus wants us to live with that tension. And the tension is, is do we give in? Do we give up? Or do we get up? And, and, and try again. We got to try again. And see, here's the problem, uh, especially for those of us who are Jesus followers. As, as Jesus followers, he doesn't really give us an option. We don't get to choose one or the other. We got to re-engage. We got to pick up the pieces and we got to move forward. And we got to aim high today and tomorrow. That's the call. Now, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a follower of, of, of Jesus, listen, number one, we're super glad that you're here. We really are. Uh, in fact, this whole church, we built this church for you. That, we exist for you. We want to help you engage with God wh- wherever you are. If you're disappointed with him, you're hurt, you've been hurt by church, this church is set up for you. And, and today is a great day to be here because here's why. What we're going to talk about today will work for you whether you're a follower of Jesus or not. What, this principle that I'm going to share today will absolutely work for you whether you have any faith in God, you don't believe in God, this will work for you no matter what, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not. But if you are a follower of Jesus, again, Jesus didn't give us an option. <laughs> we got to engage in this. We are called to live with this tension between the ideal and the real. And we got to aim high. We got to aim our lives high and shoot for the stars, but we need to be ready to give and to receive his grace when we fall short, okay? So I just wanted to set that up. Now, uh, here's the thing. Uh, one of the things we talked about also last week was that sometimes the Bible isn't as helpful as maybe we thought it would be uh, when it comes to families. If you've read the Old Testament, you'll know this is true, that there are almost no good examples of families in the Old Testament, I mean, every family's got issues and troubles. I mean, there's just a lot of a bad examples of how to do family, or there's a lot of what not to do stories in the Old Testament about families. Uh, and, uh, and then we also notice, this is interesting, that in, in the New Testament, you turn over to the New Testament, and you only find a few very specific teachings about the family in the New Testament. There's not a ton in there. In fact, uh, last week we summarized almost the entirety of the New Testament's teachings on family to these four simple points. Number one, if you weren't here, husbands, love your wives. Love your wives and be considerate to them. Number two, wives, submit to your husbands. Number three, children, obey and honor your parents. And number four, fathers, stop frustrating your kids. Don't exasperate your kids, whatever. We can talk about that in a little bit. And that's it. That's the whole enchilada, basically, of New Testament teaching on families. And it looks kind of simple, but, you know, if you look a little deeper, you know it's not, right? I mean, uh, love my wife like Jesus loved the church? Sure, I'll I'll, I'll give that a shot. Uh, uh, Submit to my husband? Have you you met my husband? (laughs) You know, honor my mom and dad, honor my parents. Good grief. My parents haven't had an original thought since 1981, man. That's uh, right. I mean, uh, or or, or don't exasperate my kids. No, no, no. What about my kids exasperating me? Let's talk about that, right? Uh, None of those things are easy to do. And yet, that's the ideal. That is what we're shooting for. That's what the Christian family is supposed to look like. And again, most of us, when we look at that list, we're like, uh, fail, uh, fail, fail, fail. We're just like, uh, I don't know. 
But Jesus would say, hey, listen, man, don't give up. Don't give up. Keep trying. I want you to live in that tension between the ideal and the real. So hopefully that sets us up. Now, today what I'm going to do, before you pull that list down, is I'm going to attempt, I'm going to try to tackle the most difficult one on that list. I want you to look at that list very carefully, and I want you to ask yourself, which one of these is the most hard one? What's the, most, what's the hardest one here? Or maybe, which one of these is the least politically correct? Or maybe, uh, uh, which, one, which one of those verses is the one that no one likes, especially women? <laughs> which one? Can you guess? Number two, that's right, exactly. This has been a disaster. I'm telling you, it has caused a lot of <laughs> issues, man, and everyone is bothered by uh, number one, and it's been, uh, you know, it's just been used in a lot of different ways over the centuries. In fact, um, even recently, it's a big news. A denomination is wrestling with this and, and thinking about it and talking about it. And I, I heard at least three news commentators this last month, as I knew this series was coming, talk about this verse. And in almost every instance, they misquoted it or misused it. And so it's just a lot of controversy around it. But the truth is, this is an extremely important uh, scripture right here. But not for the reason you think. Let me tell you why. Um, this command which was given to wives, okay, was actually given to everyone. It wasn't just wives, it was given to everyone. And no one talks about that, which is interesting, but it, this is true. Uh, let, me, let me read it to you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul wrote, he said, Wives, he's writing to families, he's in the church of Ephesus, and he's like, Wives, uh, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Um, this, it's funny. Um, on occasion, I get asked to maybe help people with their marriage, do a little counseling. That's how desperate some people get. And, uh, and so I'll meet with you and try to encourage you. I'm a good cheerleader. You know, you can do it. Uh, but sometimes what I'll do is I'll meet with couples, uh, people individually in a couple. I'll meet with them separately. And, uh, and sometimes when it's just me and the husband, the husband will sometimes ask me this question. They'll say, Pastor Troy, doesn't the Bible say that she's supposed to submit? To, doesn't it say that the Bible says, doesn't the Bible say that wives are to submit to their husbands? And I always say, yeah, um, but let me ask you a question. What's the first word in that verse? And they'll look at it and they'll go, wives. I'll say, exactly. Paul is talking to wives right here, all right? Uh, he wasn't talking to husbands. Uh, now, there are other verses that start out with husbands. I suggest you read those, version, those verses and let her deal with the ones that are written to her. Amen? Let's start with that. And so, uh, I got your back, ladies. <laughs> I want you to know that. But let me tell you why this verse is so important. Okay? Let me explain. Um, and, and it's a bigger thing. Uh, you might remember, if you've studied Jesus at all, that you'll know that Jesus taught a lot about love. He wasn't the first one to talk about love, but he talked about a higher love, a greater love. He talked about uh, that we should love God and that we should love our neighbor as we love ourselves. That's a little more different kind of love than had been talked before, right? He said that that is the greatest commandment. Love God, love others. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so Peter and Paul and some of the other New Testament writers, they come along afterwards and they're writing these letters to all these little churches around the Mediterranean, these little ecclesias, these little gatherings of people that are popping up all over the place, and they're writing letters to them, and they're trying to give them clarity to what Jesus said and what he taught. And of course, in these little churches, there are, of course, families, and there are issues with families. There are parents, and there are issues with that, and there's children, and there are issues with that, and all of that. And so Paul and Peter, as they're writing this, they're wondering, how do we apply what Jesus taught to families? And here's the thing, Jesus' version of love that he taught about had never been taught before. It was a brand new concept, loving others sacrificially, loving others to your own detriment, to the detriment of yourself. No one was putting that crazy stuff out there. But that's what Jesus was saying. It was a totally new concept. It's old-fashioned to us, it's old hat, we've heard it a hundred times, but back then, it was a completely new idea. 
And back then, the rule was might makes right. Those who have the power, those who have the authority, those who have the most resources, they make the rules, right? And they get whatever they want. Everyone else needs to bow down under them. But then Jesus came along, and he turned the world upside down. He said, those of you who are the greatest, you're actually the least. And those of you who are the least, you are the greatest. Those who serve others, those who are a slave to others, are actually the greatest. That turned the world upside down. Jesus was basically saying this. Listen, those that have the power, those who have the most power, should use their power, not for themselves, but for those who who are powerless. Those who have the most should be about helping others the most. Now that was a brand new idea. And so Peter and Paul, they're thinking, gosh, how does that principle translate to the family? And that's where this teaching comes from, right? It, Paul is taking Jesus' teaching and he's applying it to every member of the family. But it just so happens in this passage, he starts with the wives. He says this in verse 22. He said, wives, submit to your husbands. But, verse 21, the verse right before this, which no one reads, no one quotes, no one talks about, that is Paul actually giving us the overarching principle to which all of us are accountable to. Verse 22, I mean verse 21, says this. Submit to one another. Submit to one another. All y'all, submit to one another out of your reverence for Christ. Uses the same exact word, submit. All of you Jesus followers, here's the rule. If you're a follower of Jesus, here's the rule. Submit, bow down, be about the other person. Submit to one another. When you come together in church, submit to one another. Don't walk in and act like you own the place and you're in trouble. You're, you're the boss and you do this and you guys serve me. You go and serve others. When you're in your homes, when you're in your families, submit to one another. Everyone should submit to everybody. This is the principle. He's introducing a new concept. It's called mutual submission. I'm not better than you. I'm not over you. I'm under you. And me too. Mutual submission. Wives, submit to your husbands. Uh, Husbands, submit to your children. Uh, Children, submit to your parents. And so, this verse, uh, wives, submit to your husbands, was just a specific application of an overarching principle that everyone in the body of Christ should submit to everyone else. Now, did you see what else he said in there? Paul said this, he said, you should do this out of reverence for Christ, out of your reverence to Jesus, out of your respect, out of your recognition of who Jesus is and what Jesus did and how Jesus acted. In other words, you and I, we don't submit out of our reverence for each other, because let's face it, each other doesn't always deserve to be submitted to, amen? Amen. I mean, you don't, I, don't, I don't submit to you because you deserve it, because you deserve that. I submit to you out of my reverence for Jesus because of what Jesus did for me. I can do that. I can do that. And so this is a powerful principle. And this, my friend, is what Christian families are called to do. This should be our North Star for our churches and how we act with our community. We can come and fight. We're going to fight. Let's do it. No, 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 no. We submit. Jesus submitted. He laid down his power. He, although he was God, he didn't come going, bow down before me. He laid it down and he gave his life as an example for you and I. And so this is a powerful principle. This should be our North Star and it's known as mutual submission. I will leverage my power and my position and my resources for your benefit. This is the kingdom. When I, whether I'm the father, or I'm the mother, or I'm a, a brother or sister, I am going to look for ways in my family to get up under your situation, to get up under you, and to help you, and help lift your burden up, to help you. That's what I'm about. Why? Out of my reverence for Jesus. Out of my respect 
for what he did out of his example for me. Because guess what he did for me? Jesus got up under my burden. I was stuck. I was dead to my sins. And he came and he leveraged his position and his power and his time to help me. And so I'm following that example. And, 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 and these New Testament writers, I'm telling you, they, they remembered that one day up in the upper room. You might remember this scene, this incredibly dramatic thing happened. John tells us a little about it. He says that Jesus, get this, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him authority over everything. So you'd wonder, what is Jesus about to do? Jesus, knowing that all authority in heaven and earth is now his, what did he do next? You expect something, but this is what he did. It says that he got up from the table, he took off his outer robe, he wrapped a towel around his waist, he poured some water in a basin, he began washing his disciples' nasty, dirty feet. Jesus, recognizing, realizing that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, got up and said, bow down and wash my feet, you bad monkeys. No. He bowed down and washed their feet, and the disciples wigged out. They were like, this is, this is our master. This is our, our, our Lord. This is our rabbi. This is our, I mean, He's washing, wait a second, Jesus, it should be us washing your feet. And Jesus said, no, 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 this is right. I'm setting an example for you. You're my disciples. I want you to live this way. I want you to recognize that the more power that you have and the more authority that you have, the more responsibility you have to care for the people around you. The more obligation you have to serve those that are around you. So Peter and Paul are thinking, how does this apply to the family? And Paul's like, I got it. I got it. Just as Jesus, just as the Lord submitted himself to us and bowed down before us and washed our feet, we should submit ourselves to one another. Mutual submission. It's powerful. It's powerful. And here's the truth. Mutual submission works whether you're a believer or a Christian or not. I mean, it works. It, it will make things better wherever you practice this. It, it'll work in, in, your, in your family if you put it to practice. It'll work in your business if you put it that way. Your corporation, in your church, it works. It'll work in your group of friends when you do mutual submission. Mutual submission, again, is saying, hey, I'm here for you. I'm not here for me. I'm here for you. And regardless of where you fall in the hierarchy here, in the hierarchy of family, whether you're the father or you're the mother or you're the firstborn or you're the fifthborn, it doesn't matter. No one in this family is more important than anyone else. We're all here to submit to one another. I'm telling you, it's a powerful, powerful principle. And this leads me to the question that I talked about last week. If you were here last week, I promised to give you a question that if you all asked your family this question on some sort of regular basis, it would change your family. I told you, I'll give you a question that if you ask this question on a regular basis, it will save your marriage. I'm telling you, it is so powerful. Are you ready for the question? <laughs> Are you ready for the question? All right, good, all right. Listen, you're going to be let down. I shouldn't build it up too much. You're going to be like, oh, that's a weak one. Or that's too tough. But listen, this will sneak up on you the more you think about it. Here's the question. What can I do to help? What can I do to help? Is there anything I can do to help? It's a simple question. In fact, I, I just want you to, to say it out loud. I want you to practice saying it out loud. Because sometimes you think it, but you don't say it. So let's try it together. One, two, three. Ooh, that was good. You're pretty good. I had to really drag it out of last night's service, man. They were like, what can I do to help? <laughs> but you guys said that with some enthusiasm. <laughs> I am telling you, this question is a game changer. Uh, if everyone in your family, think about this, imagine this, if everyone in your family asked this question just once a day, your family dynamic would change in, in a, two days. There'd be a whole new atmosphere if everybody just asked it once a day, right? In fact, if you were the only one asking it, I think you would change the fina- family dynamic 
pretty quickly as well. If you just went around, said it once a day. Uh, let me start with kids. Students, I don't know if there's high schoolers here, middle schoolers. Listen, listen to me. Tell me, yeah. Okay, then listen to me. All right, all right. One, you hear me out. If you do this, if you say that question, listen to me, if you do this, your parents might have to pick themselves up off the floor. <laughs> you will freak them out. I'm telling you, if you do this, they, they will be shocked. I mean, imagine you're coming home from school, you're home from school, you drop your backpack, you roll into the kitchen, you're like, hey, Ma, Dad, before I go do this, I just want to know, is there anything I can do to help? They, 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 what? What? they won't know what to say. They'll be so shocked that they probably won't answer. Don't let that discourage you. Keep doing it. In fact, you want to really mess them up? Wait till they have friends over for like a, a dinner and just walk in casually in the evening to the living room and go, excuse me, guys, mom, dad, I'm sorry, but uh, is there anything I can do to help? And they'll play it off really cool. They're like, uh, no, I think everything's fine. Son, thank you. And then just walk out and go up to your room and just leave them. And here's what will happen. Their friends will turn to them and say, teach us. <laughs> oh, my God, teach us. We know nothing of this parenting thing that you speak of. How? It will blow their minds. It will mess them up because what they expect is the totally opposite, right, from you. They expect to hear things like, ah, ah. That's what they expect to get from you. And you're, instead you're saying, um, what can I do to help? It's just. And parents, if you want to play the game, do it on them. It'll mess them up equally, man. Try it on your kids. Just once a day, walk up to your kid, look him right in the eye and go, hey, um, is there anything I can do to help? No, they'll run. They'll run away. They'll go hide. They, they, they won't know what to do. Do you know what that'll do? That'll cause brain damage to your kids. It's like. Burr. And do you know what this will do for your marriage? Oh my gosh, uh, husbands, if you do this to your wife, she will probably faint. She'll swoon. She'll go backwards on the floor. And wives, you have no idea what this will do to the ego, the, the psyche of your man. I mean, I know if you ask this question, he probably won't answer. You're like, oh, mm, I got it. I'm fine. But uh, uh, it'll touch his soul. It'll spin him out. It'll touch his soul because this question is less about helping and more about caring, right? I mean, what you're saying to him when you say this is you're saying, hey, I'm aware. I'm aware of the responsibility that you carry for our family. I'm aware of all the things that you're doing and I'm here to help you. And I, I just wanna get you, I'll help you get further faster so that you can do the things that you wanna do and that you love to do because I'm in it with you. Right? It's true. Let's just say this one more time. Would you put it back up there? One more time on the count of three. One, two, three. Oh, Not that way. But that's enthusiasm. I appreciate it. Work on the tone there a little bit. <laughs> what can I do to help? Now, listen, some of you are getting a little uncomfortable. You're like, this is going too far. I'm tell I know what the barrier is to this. And let me tell you what the barrier, what will prevent you from doing it. And it's fear. The reason that you and I don't ask this question, we think it sometimes, but we don't ask it, is that we're afraid, especially men, and maybe even kids. Kids are super afraid. They're scared to death that if they ask this question, they'll end up pulling weeds all weekend long. Don't do that to them. Ease into this. But we're afraid that if we say, what can I do to help, someone's going to take advantage of us. They're going to work us, right? We're going to have to do something that we don't want to do. I don't want to do that. I don't, we're going to have to do something that no one else wants to do, right? We're, going to, we're afraid that if we ask this question, we're going to have to do something that takes away from the thing that we want to do, right? In other words, man, I'm not going to be in first place anymore. My stuff isn't number one anymore. I don't have to do your thing. But this is why Ephesians 5, uh, 21, uh, 5, 21 is so important to remind yourself of this. Paul said, Submit to one another out of your reverence for Christ. 
out of your recognition of what Jesus did. That's how we do it. See, Paul is saying like, he's saying it's as if God was up in, up in heaven one day looking down at this big old crazy world and, uh, you know, he's just kind of shaking his head and Jesus walked in the room and said, hey, hey, pops, hey, father, um, anything I can do to help? <laughs> and the father, father God said, oh, boy, you don't want to know. You don't want to know. And Jesus is like, no, 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 really, I, I, uh, what can I do to help? And the father's like, hmm. This one's going to cost you. <laughs> this one's going to hurt a little bit. Jesus is like, it's okay. I'll do it. Father's like, no, I mean, I'm telling you, you're gonna, you have to understand, you're going to go from being number one to maybe one billion. You're going to have to go to the back of the line. You're going to go to the bottom of this thing. You're going to have to go down and get under and get below every person who has ever lived to help them get unstuck out of the muck that they're stuck in. It's going to hurt. And Jesus says, I'll do it. I'll do it. And Paul said to us, out of recognition of what Jesus did, you should do the same. You should throw caution to the wind and you should throw the door open to your time, to your talent, and to your resources and make yourself available to those around you. And yes, People are probably going to take advantage of you. They're going to probably work you a little bit. And yes, you're going to become number two. And yes, you may not get to do everything that you want to do. But here's the deal. Welcome to the life of being a Jesus follower. This is what you signed up for. That you would follow in Jesus' steps. That you would, you would emulate him and how he lived. And out of your reverence and out of your gratitude for what Jesus did for you, you should go and do the same for your family. <laughs> That's tough. Now, the good news is, is that 99.99% of the time, it's not going to cost you your life like it did Jesus. You're not going to have to bleed and be tortured and be whipped and beaten. That's not going to... But it will cost you a little bit of your time and a little bit of uh, your money and maybe a little bit of your uh, energy, a little bit of your sweat, a little bit of frustration, especially because she's asking you to put together some Ikea furniture. Oh, man, can I just tell you, I can't stand that. Oh, I hate that, man. I hate putting together furniture. Is it, can anyone feel me? I will pay big bucks for you to do that for me, man. I hate it. I mean, I, I don't know how to say it. Putting furniture together sucks. And here's the thing, but here's the problem. That box of furniture has been sitting in the closet for the last six months. And I asked her, I said, hey, honey, what can I do to help? And she walked over to the closet and she pointed. And so, even though I know there's probably a few parts missing in that box. <laughs> I pick up the box, I go and sit down on the floor and I start putting it together. Because that's what love does. That's what Jesus would do for me if he was here. And the truth is, let's face it, it ain't fun. That's not fun. That little Allen wrench, that's just not fun. No doubt. But listen to me. That's the cost to having a great family. That's what it costs. That's the price to pay to have a great marriage. Some of you are like wondering, what, what's missing in our family and my marriage, man? That's why, why is there so much discombobulation here? Why is there so much dissonance in our house? I mean, what's missing? What do we got to do? How do we right this ship? You know, I'm telling you, it's like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz, right, with those little ruby slippers. The answer was right there in front of her the whole time. She's like, I want to go home. I want to go home. And they're like, you just need to click your heels three times and you're going home. And in the same way, you are like, I want a great home. I want a great family. And all you need to do is kneel down a little bit and ask, what can I do to help? This will change everything, people. Now I get it, uh, asking, what can I do to help? Here's the thing. It forces you to lean in to the relationship rather than to pull back or to pull away. Right? 
It forces you to kind of lean in to what's going on in your home and in your marriage rather than pull away, which is kind of a habit some of us do. Men, some of your wives desperately want you to lean in again, to be engaged again. Because somewhere along the way you got hurt or you got disappointed or you got wounded and you have been pulling back and pulling away. Or maybe you're working too much, you're working a lot and you're away and you're just pulling back and you're too busy building your kingdom or maybe you're into your new hobby and you're all excited about that and you're pulling away. And every time you come home, your wife, your kids, they're walking on eggshells, but they're, they're trying to lean in. Hey, hey, Dad. Hey, honey, she's leaning in. And you are pulling back. And the next day you come home, and she's like, hi, 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 hey, hi. And she's leaning in, and you're... And the next day she's leaning. I'm telling you, eventually one day she's going to lean in, and she's going to fall over. And it's going to be over. And you're going to wonder. And I've talked to many husbands who played this game, they pulled back for so many years and then she left and they're like, what happened? What, what, what happened to this love and this marriage that we had? You've been pulling back and this allows you an easy way to lean in. And I encourage you, if that's been your MO, start today. Start today with this. Don't wait. Some of you are like, well, man, she's gonna know that I heard Pastor Troy and I'm just trying to do what he said. <laughs> Who cares? Because it's going to make a change. I'm telling you, it's going to make a change. In fact, let me give you a piece of advice. Um, when you want to ask this question the least, that's when you need to ask it the most. When you feel the least like asking this question and helping, that's when you have to be, I mean, when you feel the least like helping, that's when you need to ask it the most. And that's when it will be the most powerful and transformative. It'll change Everything. And like I said, if you're not a Christian, you're not a church person, that's okay. You can still try this at home for free. That's okay. You can do it. You, in fact, you can pick out all the Jesus out of it if you want. You can like J and E and S and U and S and get that Jesus stuff out and just make it your own. And just walk up and say, hey, what can I do to help? And I'm telling you, guess what will happen? It will make your family better. It will change the, the atmosphere in your home. Try it. Try it for yourself and see. Or don't. You don't have to. But if you're a follower of Jesus, here's the deal. You and I don't have the option. This is how we are to do it. We can't bail out on this one. And here's why. Romans 5, 6 says, For while we were still helpless, when we were still helpless. Remember this verse? For while we were still helpless, at just the right time, Jesus stood up and said, how can I help? He came to this earth and he died for us. He died for us. While we were still selfish and self-involved and all about me, Jesus said, hey, how can I help? And the father said, hey, man, this isn't going to be easy. This is going to cost you. And Jesus is like, I'll do it. And he did it for us. And so where do we get off thinking that this is an option? We got to do this. This is our game. This is our MO. This is what we should be known for. And so, Peter and Paul, they basically throw this question. I'm concluding here. They're like, imagine what it would be like if every member of the family took their cues from what Jesus did. What would happen if every member of the family used their time and leveraged their position and their talent and their resources for everyone else? You know what happened? It would bring harmony and cooperation and grace and blessings back into the family. And so that's why they wrote, submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Jesus loved the church and he gave his life for her. He laid down his life. He submitted and gave his life for her. Children, honor. Honor your parents. I know they're not perfect, but lift them up. Obey them. Submit to them. And parents, dads especially, stop exasperating your kids. Mutual submission. I'm not better than you. I'm not more than you. I'm here to serve you. 
You want to change your family? What can I do to help? Simpler than you think. We pray, Father, uh, man, even a caveman can get this. I have messed up so much in my family, but I can get this. I can do this, I think. And so, Lord, I'm mindful of how there was a point in my life where I was helpless, I was stuck, I needed help. I didn't even know how much I needed help. And you, while I was still yet broken and lost, you came and died for me and saved me. You gave your life for me even before I even made one move towards you. And knowing that has changed my life and practicing that has changed my life. And so I pray that you would help every one of us have a little bit of courage, a little bit of commitment to begin to leverage what we have and who we are. We do want people to serve us. We do want people to respect us. But Lord, you've called us to lay that down and to love those that are around us and that we can be a part of the solution rather than part of the problem. So give us courage to ask that question as often as we can and to, and to, to make our families better, Lord. Help us with this, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.